So very good evening, everyone. Hope you are doing well. In today's session, we are going to talk about uh, osteoporosis, uh, the latest in the guidelines and the updates regarding osteoporosis. Uh, here we are going to have a quick review of the National Osteoporosis Guidelines, which were recently published in 2024. And uh, also I'm going to take you all through the uh, review article, which was published in uh, ACE Endocrine Practice, dealing with uh, the treatment sequence, which we need to follow for our patients with osteoporosis to help them uh, get the maximum benefit out of the osteoporosis therapy. Uh, these lectures are the latest updates in this uh, section. Uh, I already have a very detailed session on osteoporosis, uh, which uh, has been covered in my uh, previous set of lectures. Uh, all my subscribers are well aware of this. So let's start right away. And uh, as I mentioned here, I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, topics particularly. First is about a review article which was published in the endocrine practice uh, dealing with treatment sequence for osteoporosis. We are going to do some case-based scenarios based on this article. So we are all aware that the Osteoporosis is a chronic progressive disease that requires lifelong monitoring and treatment. And that's why sequencing from one treatment to another at different stages and at different uh, uh, stages of the disease is an approach that can help maximize benefits and even avoid potential risk from long-term treatment with a single agent. So that was the background of uh, this publication. Also in this uh, presentation from my side, I'll be uh, doing the case-based scenarios based on the NOG or the National Osteoporosis Guidelines for Osteoporosis, which was just published in 2024. So as I mentioned, uh, sequential treatment can help prevent bone loss and fractures, especially when we are talking about post-medication withdrawal. In this presentation, we'll discuss three case-based scenarios, which will be based on this two particular topics which I mentioned. Now, just a quick overview of the osteoporosis drugs and their mechanism and duration of action as uh, based on the NOG guidelines. So first looking at the class of drugs, which is the most commonly used class, which is the bisphosphonates, uh, mainly alendronate, risdronate, ibandronate, and zolendronate. These basically inhibit osteoclast-mediated bone desorption by binding to the bone mineral. The maximum duration for a treatment usually for uh, oral bisphosphonates is around five years, whereas for the IV, it's around three years. Now, important is that it can be extended up to 10 years for oral and up to six years for IV if high-risk category patients. And of course, we need to look into the drug holiday aspect as well. All these things have been dealt with in detail in my detailed session on osteoporosis, which is almost like around 90-minute session. Uh, the second in this uh, class of drugs is the rankle inhibitor, which is denosumab. This basically inhibits the rankle. It blocks the osteoclast formation and function. There is no defined maximum duration for this particular class of drugs. Most importantly, it should not be stopped abruptly and should always be followed with bisphosphonate therapy. If we do end up stopping this medication abruptly, it will lead to more rapid bone loss. Then we come to the anabolic agents, which are teriparatide and Abaloparatide. These are basically PTH or PATH RP analogs. They simply stimulate osteoblastic formation. The duration, maximum duration of treatment for teriparatide is uh, indicated for around 24 months, whereas it is 18 months for abaloparatide. This should uh, be followed with anti resorptive uh, agents to help preserve the gains in the bone mineral density. Next is the class which is sclerostin inhibitor, which is Romosozumab. This is the latest in the uh, medication list for uh, osteoporosis treatments. It blocks sclerostin. So it basically increases the formation and decreases the resorption. The maximum duration of the treatment recommended is for a period of one year, which is 12 months. And it should also be followed with anti resorptive therapy to help preserve the bone mineral density gains. Next is a class of drugs, which is called CERM. Or uh, this is reloxifen. So this is basically an estrogen agonist in the bone, helps in decreasing the resorption. Again, no fixed maximum duration, useful in women with breast cancer risk, less uh, benefit in terms of the hip BMD. Uh, 
Next in line is the HRT, which is estrogen and the combined HRTs. This basically replaces estrogen again, acts by decreasing resorption. Uh, maximum duration we need to reassess periodically. Best in women less than 60 with menopausal symptoms. Again, we have the last is again not much used now, almost historical use. Strontium renate is increases formation and decreases resorption, not specified duration for the maximum duration of treatment, and is rarely used nowadays because of increased cardiovascular risk. Now, this was a very important chart which was uh, presented in this review article from Endocrine Practice, and basically looking at the effect of osteoporosis medication discontinuation. So first, looking at the effect of bisphosphonates discontinuation. So in general, the effect on bone turnover will be, there will be a gradual increase of the bone turnover towards the baseline. Rate of bone loss will increase. However, the anti-fracture efficacy is well maintained for up to four to five years. So that's excellent for bisphosphonates. What about denazumab? So there is a rapid increase to levels even above baseline for the bone turnover. Hence, a abrupt stop will lead to a more rapid bone decline. As we can clearly see, there is a very rapid rate of bone loss, which is happening after the uh, discontinuation of denazumab. And there is also a prompt loss of anti-fracture efficacy. And there is an increased risk of multiple vertebral fractures. And hence, we should be making sure that whenever donizumab is discontinued, it is immediately followed with other form of therapy, usually bisphosphonates. What about teriparatide? Again, discontinuation can lead to return to the baseline from higher levels on treatment. On the other hand, the rate of bone loss will be increased as well. And there is some possible maintenance of anti-fracture efficacy to throw around for 30 months. What about romosuzumab? Again, increase to levels above the baseline. Uh, rate of bone loss, again, rapidly increases. Uh, effect on fracture after discontinuation is not yet evaluated. What about hormonal therapy like raloxifen? Again, return to the baseline for the bone turnover. What about the rate of bone loss? Again, increase. And uh, attenuation of anti-fracture efficacy for hormone therapy is unknown for raloxifen. So what is the possible suggested sequencing as mentioned in this article. So what are the second group or second class of medications we should use uh, when switching from one group to another? So the suggested transition mentioned is that from anti-resorptive to anti-resorptive. So for example, when we are talking about bisphosphonates to donazumab, what exactly happens? So there is a moderate increase in spine and hip BMD. On the other hand, if we switch from denazumab to immediately to bisphosphonates without discontinuing uh, denazumab alone, there will be a initial or moderate decrease in spine and hip BMD after long-term denazumab, but then there is maintenance in spine and hip uh, BMD after short-term denazumab. So shifting from denazumab to bisphosphonates will overall then have a beneficial effect rather than to just stop denazumab abruptly. What about osteoanabolic to anti-resorptive. So for example, we are talking about teriparatide to bisphosphonate. There is an increase in spine and hip BMD. Teriparatide to denazumab, increase in the spine and hip BMD larger than with bisphosphonates. Abeloparatide to bisphosphonates, increase in spine and hip BMD. Romazumab to bisphosphonates, increase in spine and hip BMD. And romazumab to denazumab, increase in the spine and hip BMD larger than with bisphosphonates. So overall, if we look at this particular sequence, which is anabolic to antiresorptive, this is supposedly giving us the best benefits in terms of preserving and maybe even increasing the spine and hip BMD after switching from one agent to another. What about if we do antiresorptive to osteoanabolic? So for example, if we do bisphosphonates to teriparatide, it will lead to increase in spine BMD. This is blunted compared with de novo teriparatide. In hip BMD, a decrease for at least one year and a moderate increase at 18 to 24 months is observed. What about bisphosphonate to romazumab? Increase in spine and hip BMD, blunted compared with de novo romazumab treatment. What about denazumab to teriparatide, transient six-month decrease in spine BMD, followed by moderate increase, more sustained and larger decrease in hip BMD uh, can occur. 
And what about denazumab to romazumab? Increase in spine BMD blunted compared with that in denovo romazumab and maintenance in the hip BMD. So these are basically the uh, effects of the second medication on BMDs with specific sequences, which we need to keep in mind to help us uh, solve the case scenarios, which we are going to discuss in the coming slides. So let's look at the case scenario one. So here we have a 66-year-old woman uh, who has a history of vertebral fracture, which is no doubt a fragility fracture. Her T-score is found to be minus 3.1, no prior osteoporosis treatment. So she's definitely at high risk of future fractures. So what does NOG 2024 recommend? So this patient is a very high fracture risk category. Uh, this is determined by her fragility vertebral fracture. She has a T-score which is less than minus 3, which is minus 3.1 and her age is more than 65. So based on NOG recommendations, she is classified as anabolic first therapy, which means that she will benefit the best from using an osteoanabolic agent right at the beginning of therapy, even over bisphosphonates. So step one, as mentioned by the NOG guidelines, initiate anabolic therapy first. This can be in the form of romazumab, romazumab, which is for 12 months, or teleperitide, as I mentioned, which is for up to 24 months. This should be immediately followed up with anti resorptive therapy, like either zolendronic acid, which is IV yearly, once yearly, or denazumab, six monthly, or oral bisphosphonates, example, alendronate, if other options are unsuitable or not available. We should always ensure adequate vitamin D repletion before initiating any uh, treatment. Uh, this is in the form of more than or equal to 800 units per day of vitamin D plus calcium intake of 700 to 1200 milligram per day. So this is all as per the NOC 24 recommendations, 2024 recommendations for this category of patient, which is at high risk of future fracture. What is not recommended initially for this patient? So we should ideally not start oral bisphosphonates. It is, will not be optimal in this patient. Uh, we should, uh, because the patient is already a very high risk patient with a fragility fracture, with a T-score which is minus less than minus three. We should not delay treatment by doing FRAX or DEXA. Again, already high risk is confirmed. The best treatment strategy as recommended by NOC 2024 and even as recommended by the ACE article, uh, is that uh, we should do an osteoanabolic therapy, which is romosuzumab, then followed by anti resorptive therapy. So this is the best sequence uh, for his therapy, for her therapy, uh, based on the guidelines. Let's move on to case scenario two. So this is a 72-year woman with uh, treatment for osteoporosis in the form of oral bisphosphonate, which she's already using for the last seven years. She recently sustained a hip fracture and her current BMD score is still poor at less than minus uh, is less is uh, less than minus 2.9. So that's the end of my uh, free view. If you like to subscribe uh, to my full lecture series, which contains all these 91 lectures, plus you'll have access to uh, my full 91 lectures lifelong. Uh, in addition to this, you'll get free access to the upcoming lectures uh, as a part of the package as well. So for details of my subscription, please email me to mazirules at gmail.com or you can simply WhatsApp me at 0097155743 So remember, as a part of subscription, you'll get access to the existing 91 lectures plus also all the lectures coming for lifelong. Thank you so much.